Uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, uh, Julia, a first, uh, first approach uh, to technical computing organized by, by Data uh, My name is Hassan Kawadi. I will be the host uh, of the talk today. Uh, so I, will, uh, I hope you, you will have uh, a nice time with us. Uh, so as you might know, Julia has become quickly the preferred language for data analytics. Uh, this is the first uh, talk uh, about uh, Julia language. We are very excited about that. And to make it more special, we have with us uh, Piran, one of the creators of uh, Julia language back in 2009. Uh, welcome, uh, Piran. Uh, we are, thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you. I'm glad so, to be here. We're also glad. Uh, so Viral, uh, as I said, is one of the uh, developers of uh, Julia Language. Uh, he is now uh, uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Julia Computing. Um, Hassan, since uh, you know uh, we, I couldn't sort of fully hear you, I think I'm just going to get started uh, because it, it seems like you have some internet uh, connection issues. But thank you for the the wonderful introduction. Um, my suggestion is, uh, yeah, you know, if uh, if anyone has questions, please feel free to stop me and ask. I have sort of a basic presentation and then I, I will sort of be able to do a quick hands-on demo. And uh, I, you know, my roughly sort of speaking time is about 30 to 45 minutes maybe. So there should be ample time for questions. Um, maybe since, you know, we have a, a reasonably small group, I'll request the participants to, you know, maybe say a little yeah. bit about what their background is and, uh, what languages are they using? Um, so ju just just so so that you know we we know uh, you know who is using what, and then I can sort of uh, tailor my presentation towards uh, what people might be interested in in hearing about. But let me get started, and please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I will not be watching the chat as I speak, so maybe either Hassan or Yasmin, if you guys can uh, interrupt me, uh, that will be great. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So why did we create the Julia language to start with, right? That's always the first question that why create a new programming language? And, uh, you, know, the, you know, there are four of us who created Julia, uh, Jeff Bezanson, Stefan Karpinski, Professor Alan Edelman, uh, and myself. And, uh, you know, uh, so, so for example, my, my colleague, Jeff Bezanson, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a professional language designer. He just likes to design languages day in and day out. But I am not, I'm not a, a language designer by trade. Um, you know, I like to actually work on building computational science, uh, scientific systems and sort of using, um, you know, uh, applied mathematics and scientific computing to solve some of the most challenging problems that, that we face today, um, you know, globally, right? Like whether it's climate change or the pandemic, or, or just about anything else, right? Computation has a big role to play in solving the world's problems. And that's what I see sort of my role as being. Uh, I, but, but because of you know, my collaboration with my co-founders, um, we ended up sort of taking a language approach to solving some of these computational problems uh, that, you know, that are the center of solving some of the largest challenges in the world. And uh, we ended up sort of starting with asking the question about what's broken in the world today, right? But today was 10 years ago when we started the Julia language. Um, and what was broken was that we had the two language problem, right? Python, SAS, R, MATLAB, these were all the languages that people wanted to write in, that the experts, the domain, you know, the data scientists, the engineers, um, your physical scientists, the biologists, you know, anyone who's a domain specialist who's working with algorithms was writing and, uh, you know, in this um, high level abstract environment. However, when these ideas need to be scaled up to large data sets, need to be put into production, uh, need to be run on thousands of servers or on a supercomputer, you have to rewrite these uh, same uh, high level abstract algorithms uh, in C++ or C Sharp or Java. So, effectively you're writing the same program twice. And this was a huge barrier to innovation. This was a huge barrier to get those ideas out into the real world. And this is why we started the Julia language. We, we thought that what is most broken in the world 
is that science needs its own language. And, and I like to think of Julia as the language of science. Um, and now we have sort of, you know, this was what we started out with 2009. In 2012, we released the first version of Julia. And now in 2020, 2018, we released Julia 1.0. So it's now a stable language. And now in 2020, we have released Julia 1.5. And what we really have is not just a technical platform, which is, you know, where programmers and data scientists and scientists and engineers and biologists and all these people, statisticians, financial quants, um, you know, since you guys are from Saudi Arabia, I mean, maybe I should also point out, uh, you know, oil and gas, right? That's a big industry uh, where, where Julia is a big part of. Um, and all these people are you know, now collaborating in the same language and the language is Julia, right? So, so the, the computer scientists and the domain specialists are all talking the same language. And so Julia has not just brought about a technical unification, but also a social unification that when people are using the same programming language, they're collaborating with the same set of tools and they can start talking to each other. And this is where we think that the innovation cycles are really compressed by something like Julia. And as I go along, you'll see, you know, how, you know, this achieves some of what I sort of, you know, talked about uh, something, um, how, how, how Julia being the language of science helps solve some of the most difficult scientific problems the world faces today. Now, I'm going to sort of start out with something much simpler. What is Julia, right? And, and I'm going to start out with some benchmarks. Um, this would be a good time for me to sort of know, um, if uh, uh, people have uh, you know, said anything about the programming languages that they use. So I'm just gonna quickly pop over to my chat window here. Mm -hmm. can, can you guys also see the chat window, I guess? Um, more SAS here, Python. Um, there's a statistician, maybe not programming, uh, more like a, okay, we have someone doing C++ and Python and uh, a MATLAB as well. Okay, so even in this relatively, uh, you know, small group of people who have answered these questions, right? Um, sorry, uh, we have, you know, like about five or six people who have answered and uh, you see already such a large collection of languages, but interestingly, almost everyone is using more than one. All right, so if you're coming from one of these languages, you'd be wondering, you know, what does Julia, what is in it for me if I have to, you know, if I sort of, uh, incorporate Julia into my uh, set of languages. And uh, the first example I have is from the computer language benchmark scheme. If you just Google that phrase, you will find, uh, you'll find what, you know, you, you'll find this benchmarks. It's actually a collection of 12 or 15, uh, maybe about a dozen problems. And they're, they've been sort of programmed in all these different languages. And this is only the set of languages that fits on their, you know, first chart. There are many others. So if you notice, Python does not even make it onto this one. MATLAB does not make it. R does not make it here. Um, in fact, the only dynamically typed language uh, that makes it here is Julia. And all these others are largely statically typed languages um, and everyone else is much further out. And these are sorted by ratios, right? So comparing your performance with C. So if you're low, low down here, close to this value one, that means you're as fast as C. And Julia is very close to one, right? It's between one and three. It's actually like a factor of 1.5. And um, uh, this, is, uh, this is an older version of Julia benchmarks. I believe multi-threading has not yet been enabled in Julia for these benchmarks. So Julia would come even lower down in my opinion um, out here. But you know, Python, for example, would be sort of in the 30 to 50 range. SAS would be up there. Uh, I, I think all the dynamic languages would be way up there in performance, about anywhere between 20 to 50 times slower than Julia. All right, so then, you know, over the years, many interesting new uh, benchmarks have come up. Uh, there's a graph processing benchmark in Julia uh, that, that someone put out by comparing Julia, Python, you know, so light graphs is Julia. I think network, uh, network kit is Python, and then some of these others are probably C++ based. And uh, Julia is about 100 times faster than Python in this one. Similarly, here's a k-means clustering algorithm, and Julia is 100x faster there um, over scikit-learn. 
Um, here are some data frames benchmarks that were put together by H2O.ai, a machine learning company. And they're comparing Spark, Julia, Python, the Pandas, R, everything. And Julia turns out to be over two times faster on group by operations compared to many of the other competing systems. Um, so let's see, Pandas is 92 seconds here. Julia is dataframes.jl, right? So 42 seconds. And then dplyr is 191 seconds, whereas Julia is 42. So, and then these implementations in R and Python are actually done under the hood in C++, right? So Julia is actually showing you the true power of what it means when you have a high performance language um, and, and the right kinds of abstractions and primitives. Here's another very simple benchmark, loading CSV files. And it turns out that across a variety of these benchmarks, Julia can be anywhere from you know, as fast as the existing things to 30 times faster, just for loading uh, CSV files. Um, in, fact, in Python, we are comparing with pandas. In R, we are comp uh, comparing with, uh, I believe, with fread. Um, but R is able to go multi-threaded. Python is not um, at the moment, I think, or rather pandas is not. Um, and Julia is able to leverage multiple threads as well. Now, one of the things that people love about Julia, and I, I always say this, that people always come for the performance, but stay for the experience, right? So performance is what I talked about before. Experience is what I have on, on this slide, right? And this is just one small part of the Julia experience. But uh, for example, Julia has a completely well-specified set of version dependencies uh, that can be uh, specified either at the project level or in a manifest. Um, a project defines your dependencies. So, you know, I'm going to use this and this version of the, you know, this other package um, and so on and so forth. Whereas a manifest is a complete uh, encapsulation of the state of a program about every single dependency and which version of that dependency was used. So what ends up happening is that Julia's package manager and the compute ecosystem are set up in such a way that, you know, let's say if you fast forward five years from now, in a very clear way, you will be able to regenerate the state of you know, all your programs and dependencies that were used to reproduce the results. And Julia gives you this level of reprodu reproducibility that is simply not available in any other system, in my opinion. Excuse me. However, one of the most interesting things about Julia is its uh, ability to use multiple dispatch. So many of you would be familiar with uh, object-oriented programming. Julia is a multiple dispatch system. So think about it as a generalization of object-oriented programming, but something that has come from the world of functional programming. And uh, here's an example of two very separate packages, uh, different packages, differential equations and measurements. Differential equations is what, you know, this, you know, it's, it's, it's all the differential equation. Measurements is something that introduces errors, uh, you know, that, that allows you to, well, does not introduce errors in your program, but introduces the concept of, uh, propagating errors through your computations. So for example, if we are, you know, everyone knows that the motion of a pendulum, right? If you plot it, it it's a sine wave. And, uh, you know, if you're going to simulate the pendulum, you have the value of the gravitational constant, the length of the pendul pendulum, the initial um, speed and angle and time span and so on and so forth. And, and then you put these things together and then you pass it to the solver. However, the ODE solver was only used, uh, written to work with double precision numbers. Um, but then we sort of, you know, have this amazing measurements package that came along and, you know, the idea is very straightforward that, you know, the gravitational constant is 9.79 meters per second square, but maybe we do not know it accurately. So maybe it is plus or minus, you know, 0 0.02, right? It may be either 9.77 or maybe 9.81. And similarly, the length of the pendulum and all these other measurements may have some uncertainty in them. So it turns out that if we just, you know, if, if we just use, um, if you just use these perfect values, the solver will give you the perfect answer, which would be the sine curve. But now if instead of um, the perfect values, you pass in these values, right? Uh, with with uh, uncertainty bounds or error bounds, then the plot that you get is the sine curve, but you also get the uncertainty as well on it, right? So this is, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is what ends up happening uh, in Julia. So these are two separate packages. But because of the power of multiple dispatch, they were able to integrate in, way, in a way that was simply not possible in other systems. 
a lot of people wonder who's using Julia, right? Like, is it just this thing out of MIT or is it just a small open source project? There are over 10,000 companies that we know about that are using Julia. And uh, if you go to juliacomputing.com, you can see a lot of the commercial case studies. And I'll, I'll come back to these uh, in a little bit. A lot of universities are teaching Julia as well. So, you know, these are some of the universities that are already teaching Julia, but, you know, this is again a small collection. There are um, there are at least 1,500 universities from where we see Julia downloads. Um, this on the left-hand side here is programming language rankings, right? So Julia ranked number 19 on the IEEE spectrum rankings that just came out a couple of months ago. Um, it's, I think it's phenomenal for a language like Julia to be ranked uh, this high this soon, and it has been uh, growing very steadily over the years. Um, then the Nature magazine, which is you know one of the most premier scientific magazines, had a, had a beautiful article on Julia last year with this title: "Come for the syntax, stay for the speed." A lot of books available on Julia. If you fancy yourself as someone who wants to use books uh, to learn Julia, and and many of these are actually textbooks teaching you advanced uh, algorithms and uh, and mathematics using Julia as a language, whereas you know a book like Think Julia teaches you Julia itself. Um, there are many more language, many more books available now, and I will show you a complete list on the Julia website shortly. All right. Um, I think at this point, I want to, you know, before I jump into the AI part of my presentation, I'd like to maybe show a little bit of the code and the syntax, and and also the Julia website. So let me first give you a quick tour of some of the things I mentioned in my presentation. Oops. Oh, by the way, we just had our JuliaCon 2020. Uh, this you know, was supposed to happen in Lisbon in Portugal this year. However, because of the pandemic, it, went, it, it ended up being completely online. And uh, we had, uh, you know, typically in a conference year, we have 300 uh, people who joined the conference in person. However, this year we had 26,000 people who stopped by our YouTube channel. Um, and all the videos are, are recorded and available in the YouTube playlist out here so you should be able to you know watch all of these or if you prefer to sort of go through the agenda itself we have a schedule and and you could actually look at all the talks you know uh, that happen on each year uh, sorry on each day of the conference and then you can click through and and, and watch them uh, it was uh, it was it was a fantastic conference and uh, there were 164 talks this year so i would i would highly recommend you to to go to this website and watch all right, um, here's the Julia language website. So this is, you know, if, if you're beginning, the purpose of my talk here right now is not to teach you Julia as much as to teach you how to navigate the world of Julia. So that, you know, uh, you can easily download it, uh, set it up, try it out and, and get going. So here's uh, our landing page, you know, here's what it's used for, the videos, all that good stuff, uh, packages. Um, blog posts, but the one I wanted to show you was that Julia has all the editors and tooling and IDs that you would like to use, um, you know, and, and the one that I have open right here in the background that I will switch to very quickly is VS Code. So Julia has a fantastic VS Code plugin, and I'll come back to that later. Many of you might have heard of the Jupyter Notebooks. So Jupyter is, I don't know how many of you knew this, but Jupyter actually stands for Julia, Python, and R. So uh, Julia is actually the JU in Jupiter. All right. Um, oh, this list has expanded since I saw it last, but Julia is very, very, uh, you know, well positioned on, uh, on social media. So, you know, feel free to engage with us on all, in all these places. The thing I wanted to show you was if you go to the download page, you get, you know, this is, you know, this is where you download Julia from. So this is the official release from Julia community and it's available on all the three major operating systems. We have fantastic documentation. So if you go to docs.julialang.org, uh, you, you can, get out, you can just, just immediately get access to all of this. Um, we have a fantastic blog, so feel free to sort of go through it. You can also see the first blog post on why we created Julia here. This is what sort of kickstarted the whole project and made it open source in 2012. Um, 
lots of community options. We have a fantastic discourse and uh, discourse and Slack. I would, uh, you know, if, if you're seriously interested in Julia, I would highly encourage you to join the Julia Slack channel and also uh, join the Julia discourse forum, which is more of a mailing list format. The best way to learn Julia is Julia Academy. So this is a free website that is run by the Julia community, which has lots of courses on, on learning Julia, on how to use Julia for data science, on, uh, on modeling application, on applications to the pandemic modeling, um, data frames, foundations of machine learning, deep learning, parallel computing, and so on and so forth. So, um, so here's, for example, the machine learning course, and here's, you know, so you can just basically pick up how to work with data, linear algebra, statistics, clustering, classification, graphs, numerical optimization, everything just sort of in one place. Um, and, and Buddha Nassar is, is one of the you know, most uh, prominent Julia contributors and, and researchers. So it's, it's a beautiful course and I would love you to, uh, to try it out. Um, Apart from that, I, I mentioned these books and classrooms, but there are more books. So this is the complete list of all books available in Julia and so on and so forth. I wanted to quickly draw your attention to Julia Computing. So Julia Computing provides a commercial distribution of Julia called Julia Pro and then a, a, a set of products, uh, Julia Team, which is, uh, uh, which is for running Julia in the enterprise in your company and Julia on the cloud through Julia Run. And I'll just a little bit more about these as we go along. Um, the thing I wanted to demonstrate is that a lot of times when users come to Julia, they want to know about who's using Julia, which companies are using Julia. Can I get a job if I was using Julia, right? I, I really love Julia, but uh, I, I just want to sort of, you know, make sure that uh, I have not heard about enough companies using it. So we have so, a lot of case studies from pharma companies, aerospace companies, banking, insurance, finance, um, energy companies, all uh, you know, conservation researchers, just so many amazing case studies. Uh, this one is one of my favorites, the zip lines drone delivery where, you know, this drone is used in Rwanda to deliver blood um, by, uh, by flying this drone uh, about 80 kilometers, I think 40 kilometers uh, at a distance of 40 kilometers. So it's just fantastic. This entire drone design has been done in Julia itself. And there's a talk at JuliaCon for it. Okay, so, so these are some of the case studies for those of you who would like to you know, know more about uh, the use of Julia in, in the enterprise. Okay. All right, so now I, I would like to pause and take maybe a couple of questions if there are any. I don't think there are any questions yet, but uh, feel free to ask uh, before I jump into a demo. Okay, so here's VS Code. I have loaded uh, Julia in here. And uh, you know, if you Google Julia and VS, oh sorry, you don't even need to Google anything. If you go to juliaLang.org, you can go all the way down and click on this VS Code icon and it will tell you how to install Julia on VS Code. Okay, so, so this, is, this, is the, this is the website for that. <laughs> When you install it, this is what it's gonna look like. Um, I have my Julia program here, I have my terminal here, and then I have this extra pane here called Julia Hub, which is, which is a product of Julia Computing, but I personally love to have it open because every time I run a small compute in my system, if I want to scale it up, I just have sort of you know, the number of cores and I can just start my job and, and run it on the cloud. Uh, but this is a separate plugin. You may or may not like to have it installed. I personally uh, always just keep it on uh, nowadays. All right, um, so here's what the syntax looks like. So let's maybe try to make it a little bigger here. And this is just computing pi. So here's your function. Here's a for loop in Julia, just fairly straightforward. And here's how you write an if statement. And here's how you do timings in Julia, the easy way. So what I'm doing is generating a random number in the for loop. Uh, a million times, and then I'm checking if it lands in this, you know, uh, if I if it lands in the circle or it lands outside the circle. So if you know the uh, a terrible way to estimate pi, but a very simple way is to throw throw these random darts on a square uh, which has a circle inside of it, and uh, the ratio uh, gives you you know it's a Monte Carlo algorithm, 
So the ratio gives you sort of an estimate of the value of pi. So if I go and press shift enter here now, it's actually going to run this program. So let me clear my screen and uh, do this again. Okay, so if I run this program, it ran in 0 0.009 seconds. Oops. And it estimated the value of pi to be 3.13. And, and I tried it again and it came out as 3.14. The thing I'd like to point out is that in Python, you would never ever do such a thing, right? Or in R, you would never do such a thing. I'm pretty sure you would never do this thing in SAS as well. You would never write a for loop that goes from one to one million. It is just never going to finish. I mean, it will finish, but it will finish in a long time. Whereas if you wrote this in C, it would roughly take about the same amount of time. And this is what, this is where Julia really shines, right? So it is interactive, just like, you know, Python, MATLAB, R, SAS, all of these systems, but it gives you the performance of C++. And, you know, we can actually go and look, look at the code um, of this thing. Uh, let's see. So, you know, I can actually look at the assembly code that was generated for this function. And, you know, I may not want to read all this stuff, uh, but, you know, if I'm, if I'm a certain kind of programmer who cares about performance, I might want to sort of take a poke at it and just make sure that it's doing all the right things under the hood, right? But, you know, this is what Julia does, right? It is a compiler, it's not an interpreter. And uh, because of the language design and the way the compiler works, we are able to get significant amounts of performance. Uh, sorry, Viral, we have a question. Ah, okay. Uh, does Julia use GPUs by default? That's a great question. Julia, Julia is completely able to use GPUs. Um, in fact, let me go to another website in the Julia world called juliahub.com. Um, so here's, a, this is all, you know, so Julia Hub has a website front end which shows you everything about every package. And Julia has a GPU compiler. It's called CUDA.jl. So this is the package right here. And uh, Julia is the only other language, I believe after C++, that actually has native uh, GPU code generation capabilities. So you can actually run a GPU program in Julia completely natively without learning C++ or CUDA or any of those things. And that is enabled by this CUDA.jl package. In fact, you can look at all the packages that in Julia, in the Julia world that use CUDA and there are so many different machine learning models, differential equations, solvers, physics uh, solvers, um, statistical programming systems, um, just so many different things, reinforcement learning systems that are all using Julia, uh, Julia's GPU support. Uh, I see another question here. What about analyzing Arabic text using Julia? Are there some models or libraries? You know, there is, a, there is a package in Julia for working with NLP, it's called text analysis, and it, it does quite well. Julia itself is not restricted to the ASCII um, system, so Julia actually it uses full Unicode, it's completely Unicode throughout all, all along. And I believe as a result, it should be straight, you shouldn't have to sort of do anything special to work with Arabic texts. The question is whether this text analysis package itself uh, can work with Arabic text or not? I, I do not know. I think someone should try it out and, and, and let us know how it goes. My, I suspect that many of the NLP systems out there are probably English specific, but I'm not an expert to be able to know the answer to it. Uh, however, Julia itself can do everything. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, Greek alphabets just because they show up a lot in mathematics. And so, for example, I can go alpha and go alpha equals 1.0 and beta equals you know 2.0 and then i can go you know alpha plus beta and i get that i wonder is is there a way for me to type an arabic symbol uh, i don't know how to type it on my keyboard but is there a way for me to maybe find one online and paste it in just just for fun what if i just go and type arabic symbols here um, oh, I need to be able to actually copy and paste it. Don't mind me fumbling around. Um, all right, what is this? It's not Arabic. Um, let me write something in the chat and you can copy it. Okay, that's even better. Give me, a, give me something that would be like a variable name or something. 
like a name? Yeah. Okay. Maybe let me just see if I can even. Oh. I just picked this random character. I don't know what I picked, but uh, you know it works, right? You can see. But uh, I'll, I'll I'll do what Yasmin gives me. All right. So what is this? It's like a hello or welcome, something like that. Okay, but I don't know if I can have uh, spaces in it, right? You want it without spaces? Just the first four. Okay, let, let me do it this way. Let me do it this way. Hold on. Um, I'll just make it a string. How about that? Okay. I can do this and I can go x equals this. How about that? And then I can go print ln of x and so it, it, it printed it, right? Virat, can you just um, zoom in so we can see? Ah, okay. Is this a little better? Should I zoom in one more? Yes. Yes. Right. So, you know, this is, I, I, I assigned this to X and I could ask type of X and it's a string. So Julia strings, you know, are by default Unicode strings. And, uh, and then I was able to print it and, you know, I can sort of do everything with it. Oh, I have, I, I'm wondering if I can even use this variable name now. Let's see. So if I say alpha equals I suspect I don't have the right fonts installed, right? Because it's not rendering them nice in my VS code. Yeah, sorry, it has to be right to left. I, I don't know how the right to left works in a programming language system, but I'm, I'm assuming that you guys are watching me do this and you know what you would have to do if you were to use this uh, uh, on your own. However, Julia itself is fully Unicode specific. So it is, uh, you know, it, 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 can, it can do all these things. Yep. Um, another question, Viral. Uh, is it possible to use R packages in Julia? Oh yes, that's a great question. So it is absolutely possible to use R packages in Julia. And as always, go to Julia Hub, search packages, and you go and look for R call. Call R from Julia. So there you go, here's ggplot from Julia, right there. And similarly, you can have PyCall that will call Python from Julia as well. But actually, Python may, I, I might be able to, I don't have R installed on my system, but I probably do have Python installed. So let me give you a little bit of a tool for how to install a new package. So I, I, I enter the package mode by typing right bracket here. So I, I ended up in my PKG mode here. And now I'm adding PyCall. So now, you know, I haven't installed the PyCall package in Julia 1.5 because Julia 1.5, the release just happened uh, last week. And so I have not added PyCall to this version. So what is happening now is that Julia is updating its list of packages. There are about 4,000 packages available in the Julia ecosystem already. Uh, but then Julia can also call any Python or R package. Oh, maybe I'm going to not like the fact that I did this because now it's installing Conda and uh, damn it. Apologies. Uh, I don't know what I should do here. Maybe I'll open up a new terminal. Start right there. Nope. I'm just gonna kill it. Sorry, I don't wanna wait for installing Conda on this call. You know, it, it might take a few minutes. So um, there is a way to not install Conda. Let me just see if I can figure it out. How do I use a system Python? Give me a second. Aha, I can just say env python. Okay. So I'm gonna say env python. So if I set this environment variable, oops, uh, if I set this environment variable equals slash user slash bin slash python then I suspect that um, I should be able to install this. Uh, okay, so if I now go using PyCall, 
So the first time you use the Julia package, you have to pre-compile it. This happens only for the first time, and sometimes it can take a little bit of time if it's a very complex package. I think PyCall is not too complex, so it will be ready to use very quickly. And now that I have PyCall going, for example, we can pick some examples from here and go using PyCall. We already did that, so we are going to Py import you know, the math module. So you can see it's kind of found where my math module is in my Python on my Mac um, right here. And then I can just go ahead and call sign of pi in Python. So that's, that's actually calling the Python sign and the Python pi, and we can subtract it from the Julia version. Of course, in Julia, we will use the Unicode pi, so the real pi, and there we go. Turns out they give the same answers. Um, but you can do a lot more, right? You can, you can import matplotlib and you can you know, use it for plotting. You can do all sorts of things. So it's a fairly comprehensive uh, set of capabilities. Okay. Um, so here's, so yeah, so this was a little bit of a demo. So let, let's get back now. So, you know, this is, this is a very quick uh, demo of the Julia syntax and the ID and, you know, the tooling and everything. And, uh, you know, uh, this is what it is. Let's go back to presentation. So I want to switch a little bit to the AI part of my presentation and why is Julia a good language for AI? I, and hopefully you've seen that our focus on performance, our focus on GPUs, our focus on doing all these amazing things with Julia makes it a very good language for doing high performance computing. And that makes it a natural system for machine learning. And, uh, you know, everyone has been talking about deep learning all this time and, uh, uh, you know, your standard sort of uh, image processing um, algorithms uh, are, are the ones that have been most popular uh, or natural language algorithms, NLP, um, models that do NLP, models that do computer vision, models that do uh, speech synthesis. These have been amazing solutions that have come out from the world of deep learning. And a lot of that has been enabled by two things, right? The ability to run on GPUs and automatic differentiation, right? The ability to take a derivative of your program is what is essential to making uh, the modern deep learning frameworks work. So we asked ourselves a question, you know, what if you could, you know, not just do a differentiable program, sorry, what, you know, what, it's a field that we call differentiable programming, but what if you could do automatic differentiation of more than just the deep learning models that you've written um, you know, in TensorFlow or PyTorch, right? What if we could generalize this to any Julia program? You could then take a derivative of any Julia program, put it in an optimization loop, and solve many new classes of problems that current frameworks are not well suited to solve. And this is what Andre Karpathy referred to as the software 2.0 revolution about how, you know, we'll be able to, you know, have uh, computational resources that are disposable to search the space for a program that works as opposed to write a program from scratch. And Chris Latner, when he was at Google, articulated uh, this very well about how, you know, differentiable programming can only be enabled through a language level effort. And he identified Julia and Swift as the two systems that were well suited for doing this sort of thing. Um, we had a, you know, famous tweet from Jeff Dean about Julia running on not just GPUs, but this was about TPUs. And, uh, and, and this, was, this was fantastic. Uh, a lot of people took recognition of it. So Julia today has a very rich ecosystem. The thing that makes Julia amazing uh, for AI uh, is, uh, uh, and, and machine learning is that not only do we have all the usual algorithms and not only can we call all the R and Python machine learning packages, but you can incorporate the rich libraries, the rich set of Julia packages in your deep learning ecosystem, in your uh, deep learning algorithms that you might be writing on your own. So for example, Chris Rakakis, uh, uh, who's the author of the differential equations package right here, is, you know, used these capabilities of Julia to build a scientific machine learning, um, a, a set of packages for scientific machine learning uh, the likes of which are simply not available in any other language today. Um, or the author of AlphaZero.jl, Jonathan, um, uh, you know, uh, wrote, uh, so the Julia implementation of AlphaZero is only a few hundred lines of code. You can actually read the code, understand it, and start playing around with it. 
uh, you know, there is no other comparably high performance version available in an easy to use language. So I would love to just demonstrate a very quick talk about Alpha Zero here. Um, so actually I'm going to skip this slide and just go to the next one. Well, everyone's interested in Alpha, oh, oh well. You know, I think it can't find the video or something. Let's see if I can get back to my presentation here. Apologies, I don't know what happened there. Uh, the package I was referring to was alpha0.jl, so you can find it right here. So this is the package. And, uh, and what I wanted to show was Julia's, uh, you know, capability of doing GPU and parallel computing is, is just so simple, right? That uh, once you write your program, it's very easy to make it parallel, whether it's multi-threaded or distributed, um, or whether if you want to use GPUs or a combination of all of the above. And what I was going to show you was this video, uh, which is not loading in my slides. So I'm going to just sort of quickly pop in here. And, and demonstrate it to you. Oh, boy, okay. Sorry, one more, one more try here to find this video. The easiest way to find it is the Julia Computing Sponsor Talk at Julia Talk 2020. And that's my video. I'm not gonna show you this whole thanks video, so but- for being a part of this, and thanks for all of the participants and right. all the speakers. We at Julia Computing are just thrilled to just give me a second until I, okay. So I'm gonna go full screen. So please bear with me for this demonstration of parallelism in Julia using Alpha Zero. Okay. Combines learning and search to solve complex and arbitrary problems. And it started from the game of which is this crazy game with so many complex trees and, and things to, to search through. And, and uh, AlphaZero solves this by leaning heavily on com compute. Uh, and in Julia, we are so fortunate to have great contributors to the ecosystem, like Jonathan Laurent, who we've been working with for the past two weeks to help deploy AlphaZero on the cloud. And AlphaZero.jl is his package that takes the work and, and makes it simple, extensible, and fast, and kind of is an awesome learning platform to understand how AlphaZero works. And it's extensible using Julia's great generic interface interfaces to allow you to play with new games. You can see in the logo there, it's not just for Go anymore. There's chess, tic-tac-toe. We'll be demonstrating uh, Connect 4. Um, and of course, since it's all leaning on Julia, uh, it's understandable, well-documented, and fast, between one to two orders of magnitude faster than any other high-level alternative. Traditionally, Alpha Zero implementations have been written in C++ or C or other hard languages and, and very tied to their distributed, you know, coding, code mechanisms because you have to do a lot of compute to get a, an agent trained up. Uh, well, Alpha Zero uses all of Julia's great parallelism tools, including distributed, multi-threading, and GPU parallelism to, to get the most out of all of your things. So you can run this today on, on your desktop computers, uh, and it'll take about 12 hours or more to train a, a good Connect 4 game player. Uh, and we want to show this and get this parallelized on the cloud. So let's look at what that looks like. Here we have Julia Hub in an internal release that has the, the run on cloud functionality for up and running. Uh, you can see I can add Jonathan Lawrence package here and a run in cloud button appears. I can click that. You can see it already knows the project and manifest, so it knows exactly what code to, to send out to all the workers. I can additionally tweak parameters right here in the web UI, or I can select a particular branch to run off of. I have all the parameters coded up the way I want them to be on a particular branch here, so I'll choose those. Now here comes the fun part. You can pick your cluster uh, to your heart's content here. How many nodes, how many threads, what you want to use. In this case, we want to use GPU nodes, right? So we can pick a, a beefy GPU to use, grab 
uh, 11 nodes and hit start. While that's starting, I can point out some other things here. You know, we have some time or cost limits to make sure you don't go over budget as you submit your jobs. And there you go, you can see that we've successfully submitted our job. Now we'll appear down in this bottom table where you can see exactly what we ran, what our inputs are, you can have a place for outputs, or you can even just watch the logs roll in live and see them start coming through. This is a little abridged because I only have five minutes, uh, but you can see it's starting to learn and starting to, to grab uh, the, uh, the loss and iterating here. And so that is AlphaZero doing its thing on the cloud. Now, that's just half the story, right? Getting code up and running in the cloud is great and all, but you really want to introspect the results and see what's gonna happen. So let's switch over to VS Code, of course, right? And while Sebastian's been working on all of the things there, he's also been working on an interconnect to Julia Hub, where we can download the results from a, uh, from a run from there. You can see the job list, and I'm just gonna untar these results uh, into my local namespace here, and Alpha Zero, has built into it some really cool tools for learning and introspection. So we can go to the file browser, pick out some of the plots that it generates. There's lots of depth here and lots of ways of exploring how AlphaZero does its thing. I encourage you to check that out. Let's just look at the, the benchmark of what percentage of wins do. Okay, I, this was basically what I wanted to show, right? So we're able to you know, run this, uh, you know, this computation at scale, uh, on, on a combination of CPUs, GPUs uh, in the cloud with just the press of a single button. And uh, there was a question from the audience about, uh, about how, how, does, uh, how does Julia's parallel computing work? Is it like Fortran and MPI run? So the answer is that Julia actually has its own distributed computing uh, APIs. So if you go to the Julia language documentation and then you go to the standard library, you will see a Library called distributed. I don't know why I'm finding it. Wait a second. Uh -huh, there we go. Oh, what I actually wanted to pull up was some was the manual on, on parallel computing. Okay, there we go. So so we have um, we have parallel computing APIs. Uh, so so there are three parts to it. There is asynchronous programming, which is like you know uh, if if you're familiar with Go, like Go routines or you know core routines, which is uh, you know a fairly well-known concept. Then we have multi-threading, and then we have the distributed computing. And distributed computing has sort of this remote call, a spawn and fetch kind of API. So very much like an RPC. So you have this API, and you can also use MPI.jl. So you know, these APIs are built into Julia, the remote call and fetch. However, if you want to use MPI style things, you can just go and type MPI and uh, you, can, you, can, you, can use, you can use those as well. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. I think I don't have a whole lot more left in my presentation there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had some results from a, from a drug simulation at Pfizer and some amazing products that are being built in the world of pharma. And then, yeah, I think that was my last slide. So I'll just leave it up there. Uh, thank you. Uh, this definitely was helpful. And uh, uh, I think everyone is excited now to use Julia and try it. Um, we will end up with some questions from the audience, if anyone is... Um, uh, please feel free to ask. ...in the Q&A box. First, we want to know if Julia supports web applications and is there any framework for web applications using Julia? 
for web applications. Yes, there is a framework called genie.jl. Actually, let me go back here. So there's a, it's called, it's called genie.jl. That's a web framework in Julia. And uh, there is actually also at Julia Con, there was a fantastic um, workshop. Oops, not register, I wanted live schedule. Let's see, uh, how do I find this live schedule? So there is a whole, um, yeah, building microservices in Julia and applications in Julia. So this is a whole, you know, if you click on this YouTube link, you will be able to find, uh, it's, it's a whole one day workshop on how to build uh, web applications in Julia. Okay, thank you. There is another question from Raab. Where do you recommend to start from someone you first heard about Julia today? I would suggest go to juliaacademy.com and get started here with uh, the introduction to Julia by Dr. Jane Harriman. Okay, another question from Ahmed. Uh, what about security patches? Is there any uh, periodic uh, ones? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. What about security patches? Is there any periodic ones? As, I mean, security patches, you know, whenever there is a security issue, we just sort of apply it and fix it, and we have a, you know, a security process. So for people to report um, security issues in Julia, and, and then we have a process of, you know, addressing them and fixing them. I don't know if that answers the question. Okay. Um. Uh, another question is uh, Julia compiler similar to Python? It is actually not similar to Python. In, it's actually very different. Uh, Julia is a JIT compiler, whereas Python is an interpreter. So, well, I mean, when I say JIT, it's not actually technically accurate, but Julia is actually a compiler. So remember how I showed you, um, you know, that you can look at the, the assembly code from a Julia program like that. I mean, you cannot do this in Python, right? You cannot see what, what's happening. So uh, Julia is a compiler, whereas Python is an interpreter. And that is why Julia is, you know, while it retains the ease of Python, it is just so much faster. Okay, thank you. I think that's it. Uh, back to you, Hassan. Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, I want to ask you, Pirat, about uh, how to introduce uh, Julia to organizations in academia and uh, industry. Yeah, how to introduce, so in academia, it's usually, you know, the, the usually the, the professor, the, you know, the, the, there are two parts of it, right? There is the research angle and then there is the teaching part of it. And Julia is now taught in so many different classes, right? So if you go to julialang.org, you have a lot of teaching material available in this learn section. So all the classes that teach Julia, you can, you can see many of them actually publish their lecture notes online. And so depending on the nature of the class you're teaching in Julia, you may be able to actually reuse a lot of this work. Um, and, and of course, there are also all these textbooks like I pointed out. Um, and so you, you, you can also uh, put together a class using one of these textbooks uh, as well. Um, in terms of organizations, usually, you know, the way to introduce Julia is kind of, you know, the way I'm doing this right now, right? So people should you, you usually need one champion who will try out something, do a POC, demonstrate it to your colleagues, and then sort of go from there. And one of the things that organizations want to know is that, is there a company supporting this, right? Because, you know, what if I run into an open source issue or something and there is no fix in the community? Is there a company that can sort of, you know, stand behind Julia and actually sort of support a company when they use it? And the answer is yes. So Julia Computing is that company. We support our customers commercially and you know, in a variety of different ways through support and products. So I think that is sort of you know, the combination of all the technical materials and then you know, the business uh, assurances is what I think you need at a company. Okay, thank you very much, Avial. I have another question. Uh, when I try to debug my code, uh, when, I, when I do it usually in other languages like uh, Python or Java, I can't just uh, write the question uh, in uh, the search engine and I will find an answer. Uh, in Julia, uh, I noticed that uh, the community is not that uh, big yet. So, yes. if, 
So how to overcome this uh, issue? Yeah, so you know the Stack Overflow in Julia is getting a whole lot better, right? It's uh, it's you know it has grown dramatically over the years. But a, a lot of the reasons why people don't find the answers on Stack Overflow is because the answers usually exist on Discourse, on the Julia Discourse. So if you come here, if you look at the Julia Discourse, I mean there are almost ten thousand people who are subscribed to this Discourse, uh, you know, system here, and. Uh, Usually people who have questions about Julia, they usually find the answers right here. And I would suggest checking the Julia discourse as well as online. But at the end of the day, Julia is a relatively newer community compared to Python and R. So you will not find the answers as easily and as often as you might in other systems. But I would say that join the Julia language uh, you know, discourse. And by the way, I should also suggest joining the Julia language Slack. I can demonstrate it right here. Uh, this the slack has a help desk channel where it's very easy for you to get answers and help from people so here's your julia language slack and you know if i go to the general channel here there are you know there are 7000 people that are on this slack channel i mean it's huge so um and and also remember if you find a question that is not answered file if i ask the question on stack overflow someone will eventually get around answering it Okay, thank you very much. So this is the end of the meetup. Um, thank you, Vera. It was an interesting meetup. Thank you, our audience, for joining. We hope to see you in our next event. And yeah. Thank you for inviting me, Yasmin. Uh, we'll try to Julia, join the community. All right, bye. We will. We will. Thank you so much. Bye bye.